Yeah, I joined Basel Reed about um, three years ago um, as the executive director looking after the mining divisions. As you know, Basel Reed has got several divisions. Con uh, contract mining is one of them. Uh, roads, uh, and civils, uh, buildings, uh, the other divisions. Um, and I've been with Basel Reed now for three years. Uh, it's been wonderful three years. Uh, and it's fascinating looking after the contract mining services for uh, the big mining houses. Absolutely. And um, what have been some of the keys to Basel Reed's success over the last three to five years? Well, I mean, really, in, in the mining space, uh, the issue of productivity is a key, uh, you know, number one priority in, uh, you know, in terms of survival in the, a very depressed mining industry, as you know. Um, but, you know, I always say, you know, productivity without safety is always, uh, it's, it's useless. Um, so safety is our number one priority. And we've had uh, wonderful records, uh, but with safety, it's, it's like pushing water up the, uh, up the hill. Uh, you can never say you've succeeded. Um, but, you know, we are very proud of our record of safety performance. Uh, we haven't had a fatality. We've had uh, two uh, lost time injuries in the last uh, three years, which is, uh, you know, more than uh, a better performance than many other industries. One injury is one injury too many. Uh, so we are not satisfied with the status quo. So, um, if I have to summarize our key successes, we've been able to survive in the, in the last uh, three years. Where it's been very difficult in the industry, and we've uh, you know, improved on our safety performance as well. Uh, tough 2016, as you alluded to, 2017 looking like it's a bit more promising for the industry. Yes, indeed. Um, it, it's definitely a m much better position uh, this time around uh, versus last year. I was here in the mining in Dava, uh, where everyone was, uh, you know, almost uh, uh, being depressed, and maybe it's just putting it lightly. Um, it's looking much better. Uh, we're kicking off this year with new projects, um, so it's definitely the demand in our, for our services has actually improved, but it's nowhere near uh, the, the, you know, the boom that we've experienced in. Uh, few years ago, uh, but what definitely think, better. And what do you think might be the catalyst to, to, to really get that, that next wave fully crested, so to speak? I, I think I think what has happened is that uh, you know the correction was probably extreme. The pendulum swung quite extreme, where we saw many projects being shelved. Um, but you're starting to see commodity prices actually picking up, um, and you know that talks to you know demand and supply kind of balance. As I said earlier, maybe the pendulum swing uh, you know, in terms of supply, we cut, we cut uh, too much supply into the market. Now the demand is uh, you know, exceeding supply, so hence the prices are actually picking up. So that's really the key thing around uh, you know, what, what will kick off uh, the next cycle. Is, is and in terms of commodities, uh, which are showing the most uh, promise for you? We've seen, we've seen phenomenal price growth in, in zinc. I think zinc has been, you know, for the last two years, you know, the, the main performer, mainly uh, because uh, you know, the supply is a lot more concentrated. And those companies are, you know, they were sitting on projects uh, and now being developed. Uh, we've heard about Hamsbeck, which has been sitting and dropped, going about for more than 45 years, uh, which is now uh, going uh, into supplying into the that uh, deficit, uh, supply de deficit, as I mentioned earlier. And you guys are also involved in infrastructure development, that's also a key driver for economic growth? Indeed. Uh, Bezzer Reed, as I say, is a construction company, so you know, everything from ports, uh, roads, um, uh, railway infrastructure, we, we do those things. Um, we, we, build, uh, we do buildings uh, in, the, in the mining in industry itself, uh, we do uh, platforms, civil platforms that are associated with developing mines. And, so, Absolutely, and the port development is very vital for mining. A lot, a lot of money has been thrown in, in that direction. Yeah, especially with the bulk commodities, you know, like coal, iron ore. And, uh, and, and the key to unlock some of this, uh, you know, rich mineral deposits is to have a port to export it, uh, to go to those uh, markets where the, uh, the commodity is being used to, for development. So. Okay. And your impressions of the mining in Darbo thus far? I, I, 
as I said, last year it was, uh, it was rather depressing. Uh, this year there's a little bit more enthusiasm. Uh, you can feel a little bit more energy. Uh, <laughs> it's nowhere near the, you know, the, the bull market that we've seen in the past, but generally there's a, there's, there's a good vibe, a much better vibe. We've seen uh, many of our clients here uh, talking bullish about the future. Uh, there's a lot of caution, uh, which is which is probably the right thing. I think we've been in the past been too optimistic and uh, ended up with a lot of uh, disappointment. So, and what was your takeaway from from the minister's speech on Monday? Unfortunately, I missed uh, I missed the minister's speech. But what what I've actually read uh, and listened to the commentary around it is that there's still uh, you know, a little bit of trust building that needs to happen between the, the government, particularly in South Africa and, uh, you know, and the industry in general. I think we're still talking past each other. There's still too many uh, megaphone <laughs> diplomacy, which, which doesn't bode well. Uh, but I hope uh, in, in, in closed doors we are talking about uh, shared growth uh, objectives, uh, which is what we absolutely need in, uh, in South Africa. I mean, South Africa is still you know, the premier destination for minerals. Uh, we've got very robust infrastructure. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we make a success of it. Absolutely. And what, what sort of training do you provide in, in the various industries you support? Yeah, we, we do, you know, from what, what I can term basic training, operator training on various machinery that we use, uh, all the way to, you know, much more advanced uh, training, engineering. Uh, we've got a lot of engineering versus, particularly mining engineering, mechanical engineering in terms of maintenance and that, uh, and that type of thing. Lasting certificates, which is crucial for our industry um, and, and, you know, and so forth. Absolutely, and, and the level of skill, and the level of, of, of graduate coming out of the University of South Africa, are we up to standard internationally? Definitely, I think South Africa is a premier mining uh, uh, training school. Uh, I think you know, the Australians might say you know, that that's where mining, the centre of uh, mining is, but uh, I still think South Africa is good at some of the best. Uh, we are not, nowhere near producing enough engineers uh, and, and the skills. For, to feed it to the industry. Uh, we also compete with other sectors where they tend to like our engineers to go into financial services, uh, which is a lot more attractive for some youngsters. You know, it's better than being in uh, hot air zone uh, or the middle of uh, you know, a desert somewhere. It's better to be in Santon. But yeah, so we, we, we've got top, top, top skills. Uh, I travel all over the world. I find South Africans, uh, South African trained graduates all over the world, and they are top, top skills. As we look beyond South Africa, what sort of footprint does Basel Reed have in Africa and key growth areas? So we've we've uh, we've looked at um, you know traditionally we've operated uh, in what we call SADC, uh, but we've been uh, in places where we don't speak the language. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Portuguese countries like uh, Angola, we've had experience there. Uh, we've ex operated in Zambia, uh, Sierra Leone. Um, so we've we've looked in uh, all those uh, places. Uh, but you know, the focus now for the next few years is that we need to really build a very strong base in the SADC region. We really understand this this part of the world, and there's a lot of mining growth that is actually happening in this. World. Whereas we are also looking at uh, places like West Africa, uh, which is a very good uh, you know, goal. Uh, and when we look at SADC, when we look at SADC, how, how do you think we can sort of hunt in packs as, as that region and, and really uh, piggyback with each other's infrastructure and, and talent? Yeah, I think I think you know the whole concept of linking the infrastructure in the SADC region it's it's crucial. I think mining legislation is very much aligned in the Sadika region. It's, it's amazing the things that you talk about in South Africa is the same kind of concept about in Namibia, maybe different terminology. Um, so, you know, the, the, 
the collaboration, as it were, from a government point of view, you can see it. I think the Chamber of Mines uh, in the various countries, I think there's an opportunity there to, for us to collaborate in terms of exchange of skills and, and, and you know, the kind of same topic that businesses <laughs> in the chambers uh, can actually exchange in that, in that space. And your, and your plans for the next five years? Any exciting projects in the pipeline? So we have a very exciting project um, which we are kicking off in, the, in this quarter of this year in Namibia. I'm not uh, at liberty to say exactly that, but it's actually in the media um, in Namibia. So it's a mine called Scorpion Zinc. Uh, but um, you know, I think we, we are in the final process of uh, opening up that, that mine. It's a, it's a mine that is coming to an end of its life, but they realize bringing in contractors who are a lot more pro uh, productive can actually contribute to their, you know, extending the life of that. So we're looking forward to, to that uh, particular project. Exactly, you know, mine closure has been a big talking point. Uh, what are some of the in innovative ways we can use mines once they've so-called reached their shelf life? Yeah, I think I think part of it is that in the past, my experience has been, you know, the mine closure and mine operations have been spoken about as two different things. Uh, you can actually, in your mine plan, mine in such a way that you minimize your closure liability uh, by just dumping for example in a way that you you know it's the final slope that you're looking for if you want to do uh, things in, in, in that in the, in the form um, open cast mining in the coal space actually affected that kind of industry it, it turns out it's actually a cheaper method to mine rather than you know mining and then coming back a year later where there is no revenue and all you're doing is, is, uh, is actually doing rehabilitation. So part of it is, is to you know to partner with your clients and actually showing that there's a better way of optimizing the mine plan which includes uh, rehabilitation that is required. And uh, speaking of optimization, technology must be at the forefront of that as we go forward as well? Very much. Um, I mean, for, for us, uh, the main thrust for technology, if it's not just about improving productivity, uh, we, we use things like dispatch system, modular dispatch system, where you know you can optimize your track uh, cycle and dispatching the cycles to the right uh, uh, shovels. But you know, the safety is a key focus. One of the areas that we are trialing, in fact, not just trialing, pushing forward, is the issue around foot fatigue man management devices that can actually figure out that you're, you're about to fall asleep and warn you uh, that you're about to fall asleep and you know, prevent accidents from happening. So technology is key for us, uh, remote operations um, you know, where you can control several machines using remote, uh, it's crucial for us. And the Internet of Things will obviously build on, on that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, your cell phone nowadays is the center of the universe, uh, and <laughs> there is a number of technologies that we're looking at that you know, gives us information at, at the tip of the finger. But it also helps us understand what, if you call it, what went wrong. And you know, we've we've got this principle of asset optimization. But with asset optimization, you need to understand what were your problems in the past and really focus on the big ones. So, for example, your engine is failing more frequently than any other issue. Really understanding how that engine actually failed, uh, that helps you prevent it from happening in the future. And that bodes well for your productivity. It saves you time and money as well. That's exactly what it is. Absolutely. And uh, encountering the fluctuations in RAND value, that, that must give you a few headaches. How, how, do you, how do you plan for that kind of thing? It's, uh, it's a very difficult, uh, you know, what do they say about economists and predicting what their rent is going to be in, in the future. So the only thing you can do is, because the, the, the exchange rate is outside your control, the only thing you can do is to manage things that are under your control. So productivity is key. Um, it's really to understand that if you're buying this equipment at a very uh, hard currency like a dollar, better use it uh, much more productive uh, and that's really what, what our focus is. Uh, so you can only control your own costs, uh, your input costs, uh, 
and the rest of it, is, you know, you've got to ride the, the wave. And when there's a trough or there's an upward, you need to be able to respond to that. And the only way you can respond to it is to manage you know, your own uh, controllable uh, variables.